can we get can we can we get another microphone for uh, the couch as well? Uh, hey, everybody, welcome to the Nerd HQ. Oh my God! Welcome to the Nerd HQ, everybody. That's so much better. Ah, oh, thank you very much. You're f oh oh did you were you partying with us last night? Who, by the way, who came to the party last night? That was friggin' epic. You, if you didn't come to the party, you missed out. That's all I can say. Um, I'm gonna sit here. I'm gonna sit somewhere. Um, so uh, I, I I'm I'm here I'm here to tap dance for a second because because Guillermo's in traffic. Uh, because no 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 it's all good. He's he's on his way. He is en route. And by the way, he's super stoked to be here. And and uh, I'm really super stoked that you guys all uh, wanted to be here to talk to him and me and Peter. Um, but, you know, as you know, Comic-Con is nuts, and there are so many things going on. And in fact, every year more things pop up, like Nerd HQ last year. So people are running all over the place. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so <clears throat> people are literally running all over the place, and there are 150,000 people that you're trying to cut cars through uh, without hitting them, which, which uh, I'm not even going to go there. Anyway, the point is, uh, the point is, so I, I just want to come out here and, and it's, say a couple of things. One, I love and appreciate every single one of you guys. You realize that uh, this panel alone has raised somewhere about $4,500 for Operation Smile. So thank you. Um, at the Nerd Machine, we're just about bringing you guys the best experience that we can bring you. Uh, did anybody come to Nerd HQ last year? Did anybody? Oh, awesome. Well, for all of you guys, all of you noobs that are here with us, uh, this is something fresh to hear. Uh, we, we just, we believe that, uh, we can, you can have panels and, uh, and, and they can, you, you can, you can see each other. I can see you, sir. Hello. Um, and I can see you in the back as well. And I can see the world that I'm live streaming to. Uh, everybody say hi to the world right now. Hi world. Yay. That's fun. Um, and, and, but we also didn't want to gouge you guys. We know that you come down here spending a lot of cash for a lot of things that you really love. Uh, and we also didn't want to take your money for anything other than helping other people as far as this stuff is concerned, you know? And we have amazing people like Guillermo, like Peter, like the other panelists that have come on board and they're just donating their time, they're donating their energy to give it to you and to raise money for something bigger than all of us. So thank you for believing in that vision. That means the world to us. Thank you. Oh, ready? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Still not ready, still not ready. Couple of, uh, <laughs> you guys are great, thank you. Uh, thank you for your patience, by the way. Thank you. A um, couple of things. Uh, while I'm talking right now, I don't mind any flash photography, but is there any flash photography allowed in this panel? No. Very good. One for one. Is there any video allowed in this panel? No. Very good. Two for two. I have very menacing security guards with big smiles <laughs> that are going to be checking your phones. You might not even see them. They will be. They'll be over your shoulders. Please do not record video. Please do not take flash photography. We have amazing guys with cameras, amazing cameras. You can watch all this later. And if you ask a question, you'll be highlighted. It'll be amazing. You'll be a star of a panel. Um, uh, what else can I do? Oh, I, you know, one of our awesome sponsors, by the way, Best Buy, uh, they're, uh, they're bringing a lot of these panels to you guys. They have given us a bunch of these $100 gift cards to give out to you. So, so, actually, hold on. I'm going to ask, uh, who can, uh, I can't ask you guys because you'll, you'll know how this works. I need, I need a random number. Dave, yell me a number. 13. Oh, I got there. Who's 13? 13. Lucky, lucky number 13 on Friday the 13th, ladies and gentlemen. Courtesy of Best Buy. Spend that wisely, my son. Uh, preferable be on electronics that won't be obsolete next year. Um, uh, what else can I say? You know what? Screw it. I'll just, I'll just, I'll talk. Uh, what do you guys want to know? <laughs> yes, question down here. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Do you have a microphone in your hand? Well, then nobody can hear you. Is this one working? H Hello? What? There you go. Oh, okay. There you go. Are we allowed to ask any question to Guillermo? You are or? allowed to ask any question. Now, obviously, we want to talk about Guardians. Is everybody excited about Guardians? Yeah? As am I, as is Peter, as is Guillermo. You're allowed to ask whatever you want. This is an unmoderated panel. I'm not sitting up here with Guillermo and Peter to moderate. I'm sitting out here because I did a movie called Tangled, which is an animated movie. And thank you for those who have seen it and like it. And uh, so we thought it'd be kind of fun to have different perspectives of people who work in both live action and animation. And since it's my event, I get to do that. Uh, and because I friggin' love these guys and I'm just stoked to be here. Uh, so yes, it's unmoderated. You can ask whatever question you want. Do not expect an answer to any question that you ask, by the way. Sometimes they're so off the wall, there's really no answer to give. 
Somebody, somebody the other day asked, uh, what panel was that? I, oh, in the, in the Twilight panel, somebody asked, what color would a Smurf turn if you choked it? Um, <laughs> which, by the way, if you think about it, is mind-melding. That's well, It's already blue. Uh, so, and the, nobody really knew how to answer that. And I was like, look, move on. It's all good. Like, you know, it's, I just, I like the idea that you guys get to have all this time for yourselves, you know? I hope you're into that idea, too. Um, uh, any other questions? I love this. It's all my time. I could just shiz lounge this. What's up? Yes, thank you for buying a shirt, by the way. If you haven't already bought a shirt, buy a shirt. Okay. Oh, what is this one, you wonder? This is the exclusive Tomb Raider shirt that we make. Fantastic. Continue. Um, <laughs> would you like to do any more voice work in any more animated movies? I would be tickled pink to do voice work. Uh, first of all, it's super easy. Um, it's one of the greatest jobs in the world as an actor. I mean, it's actually not that easy. It's, uh, or it's, it's difficult in different ways, you know? Uh, you don't have to go through hair and makeup. You don't have to wear wardrobe. I could stumble in in my PJs, unshorn, unshowered, which is not very courteous to the people recording my voice, uh, but whatever. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, it's a challenge being able to con create a whole character just with your voice, really. You know, you don't, you, don't, you don't have your arms and legs and all those other things uh, or my flashy eyes when I was Chuck. Like, I can't do that. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm depending on animators to make all that happen. So it's, uh, but it's such a great job. And my whole life, I grew up watching Disney movies. Like, every, anybody else Disney nerds out here? Big Disney movies? Uh, and, and DreamWorks nerds as well. Yeah, DreamWorks nerds out there, yeah. Uh, so animated movies and animated cartoons, like my whole life, I loved them. And uh, so when I got to do Tangled, I, it really was one of those like pinch me moments of like, I dreamt this, like I dreamt this as a child. I, I used to impersonate Donald Duck daily which I don't do anymore, so don't ask. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> you gotta practice, otherwise. It was horrible then, what am I, who am I kidding? Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yes, you in the gear shirt. Wait, wait, microphone coming at you. Thank you for buying a shirt, by the way. Thank you. Actually, I bought it last year. You bought it last year? Cool. Yeah, oh, thank I'm you for being here last year and thank you for coming back. Are you excited for Thor 2? I am incredibly excited for Thor 2, yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I am, uh, Josh Dallas had scheduling conflicts uh, with Once Upon a Time and was not able to reprise his role as Fandral the Dashing. Uh, Marvel remembered me from the first time around and said, hey man, would you like to do this? And I said, does the Pope wear a beanie on Sunday? Of course I want to do this. That would be unbelievable, which is why I look somewhat like a pedophile. Um, <laughs> Or Puss in Boots or whatever. Uh, which leads to another question. Is Puss in Boots a pedophile? No, no, no. He's a cat, folks. He's a cat. Uh, so I'm beyond stoked. I mean, I had a, we, Stan Lee was on a panel with me earlier today. Was anybody at the Stan Lee panel? Nice. By the way, for those of you who are doing multiple panels with us, I love you. Thank you. It means, even if you're just doing one panel, I love you too. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying it, it really means, oh, we're, oh, oh, guess what? We're ready to rock, everybody. I believe. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, coming to the stage, please, Guillermo del Toro and Peter Ramsey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for uh, Guillermo and Peter, please. Oh, and really quick, before the questions start, we have uh, exclusive, we have signed posters of the Guardians, Rise of the Guardians, there are 20 of them. So the way we figured it out is, if you ask a question, you will get a poster. <laughs> Until we run out, and then, sorry. And, and they, they, they were signed in the editing room. The only drawback is I signed them too, so the value might go down just a little bit. <laughs> Actually, can I get a volunteer uh, to volunteer passing these out to those who ask questions? Tej, thank you very much. There you go. All right. And who's got the first question right here in the front? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, my question is regarding to film. Uh, when you're doing, when you're doing a, a practical film, when do you decide when you want to do a practical set or you want to go CG? I always wonder, like watching all the special features and whatnot, I always, I'm just so amazed that you, you, know, you get your artists to carve out a foam and whatnot. I always wondered, when do you know when you want to go practical and when you want to go CG? Well, I, I always want to go practical. I mean, I really, really want to do as much 
I, I think that a, a great set in a movie informs the actors, helps me. I, I get in and I find a new angle that is impossible to find in a virtual set. So I, I am really a guy that likes to build stuff. First of all, because of that. Second, because I, I buy it from the company and put it in my house. <laughs> you know? But, but I, I love that. And the, the reality is that there's a point where it's not practical. You know, you have, in my case, I shoot 185. And there's a certain distance you need to see above, let's say, 10 feet. You need a long set. So if it's not practical, if you're just going to pan uh, or tilt down and you're never going to see that part of the set again, then it's not practical to build it just for that or just build that portion. And, uh, uh, you know, there are sets that are so huge that I, I can only build a portion and then the rest is digital. But I, I, I say digital should be only and only for things you cannot do physically. Not, not making them easier making them possible. Because easy is not, not the answer. You, you gotta do the hardest thing you can, and then if it's not possible, you do it digital. Both in effects and in sets. Thank you. If my pants rip, please let me know. Because <laughs> I feel so tight in this chair, it's horrible. It was got, yes, right over here. Uh, yes, um, I was, ex well, I'm sure many people were, but um, extremely disappointed to hear that you wouldn't be able to uh, direct the Hobbit movie. Um, and I was just kind of curious what your vision would have been for that if you even got that far. <laughs> uh, she was very disappointed that you couldn't direct The Hobbit. And had you been able to still do it, what would your vision have been, if different? I, I think it's, it's, it's really, um, it's not polite or not respectful to talk about my vision at this stage. I think that everybody, and that includes myself, we should defer to the director, who's the right director, who is in the right hands, and I'm, I think that's the vision that I'm focusing on. I want to see the movie. I think um, anything other than that would be, uh, um, I, I think it's out of line for me to comment on that. I think that every director has uh, the capacity to interpret the same material than another guy and make it different because we speak from, from who we are. So it would have been different probably, you know, but um, I, 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 the only thing I can elaborate on is in the right hands, let's watch it. No? Yeah. What a gent. Uh, yes, right back there. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Is this mic not? So, good? Uh, shout it. Shout it from the rooftops. The strain? Well, I, I, we, are, we are thinking about doing The Strain as a cable series. So I don't want to make it short. I want to make it brutal and long. <laughs> just, just, just like my sex life. <laughs> in the past. In I, the just, past. <laughs> I just got an insight into Guillermo del Toro that I, I, can't, un, I can't unhear that. It's much, I can't much unhear today. that. Uh, who's, got the, who's got the mic next? Right back here? Oh, right over here. Yes, sir. Um, hi. Uh, first, I want to say some words in Spanish. Um, como mexicano, me siento muy orgulloso de que alguien como tú nos represente. He's talking about Gracias. my, my mother. You. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> you, sir. You and I. Sunset. Yeah, okay. Pistol. <laughs> as I say that as a Mexican, I feel very proud that someone as him, so talented, represent us. And, and obese and uh, morbidly. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you. Um, well, my question is, I know that you are involved in a lot of cool projects, and, but I haven't heard anything about Insane, the video game. Are you still yeah. involved there? Well, Insane, uh, may, some of you may know or some of you may not, but THQ, the company that was developing, it went through a huge yes. restructuring. And uh, Danny Wilson, who was developing it with us, left the company. So I'm talking to them to see if they want to continue. We are in the process of seeing we were quite advanced, I'm very happy with it, but uh, I, at this stage, in the next couple of weeks, we will resolve if it continues or if it doesn't continue there or not, or, you know, so it's a little bit in the air. We, we, uh, we had Guy Davis uh, come on board to design the most absolutely disturbing monsters we've ever designed, and the, it, we were creating some really, really, really 
disturbing stuff. But I don't know, I don't know, you know, he, he, he created with us for over a year uh, sets, creatures. Uh, we we created the whole plot for the whole game. And we were starting to do uh, R&D on the technical things we wanted to try. And then this, the, this earthquake happened on THQ. So we don't know what's uh, going to be of it. But in the next couple of weeks, we should know. Okay. Thank you. Right in front. Hi. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask is about favorite movie memories. And since this is about an animated film, I'd like to know all of your favorite animated movie memories, like watching a movie for the first time or whatever your favorite animated movie memory is. All right. I, I'll start off with that one. Uh, I think my, probably my favorite, favorite... Fritz the Cat. <laughs> I live that. No. Um, uh, probably my favorite memory is the earliest one that I have. I actually saw a, a re-release of Snow White when I was okay. about four in pajamas in the back of my mom and dad's car at a drive-in, and it just it completely blew me away. It was just mesmerizing. I, and I, I remember just about everything about that evening, like the little snacks we had and what was on the pajamas, but the... Uh, just the magic of the movie was something I, I've never forgotten to this day. So I don't know if it infected my DNA and that's why I'm here, but that, that would probably rank as mine. How about you, Guillermo? I think Chernobyl opening the wings on top of uh, Night of the Bald Mountain, you know, that is, I'm still working hard to do a moment as, as amazing as that. You know, the moment Chernobyl uh, unfolds and, and raises, I have every Chernobyl collectible ever made at home, I mean, it's, I have a Chernobyl crush, and I, I adore it. I, you know, that's a big, big memory. The other ones are very strange because in Mexico, we have a lot of Japanese feature films being released. So there's, um, uh, there's one that in America was called Alakazam the Great. You know, and I was mesmerized by that. And Gulliver in Space and, um, you know, Puss in Boots, the one that Miyazaki worked as an animator in Toho, he did one of the sequences, and I remember it, and years later I encountered Miyazaki, and there was something in me that said, this is the same animator that did that movie I saw as a kid, and it was true. I found out he was one of, uh, together with uh, Takahata, he had animated uh, one portion of that film. But, uh, so you know, I think mine are a little strange. <laughs> uh, I would say, who, who asked, oh, you asked a question. Um, I, I, I would say that probably the, the stuff that, that's like seared into my memory the most or, or that what shaped me the most is um, when I was a kid, uh, I'm 32, the Disney Channel was just kind of starting and, and it was all the Disney vault. There was no like original programming. It was, we got to watch all the stuff that our parents watched or that even their parents watched perhaps, you know, and uh, all of the Disney shorts I, and, and not just necessarily like Mickey and Goofy and Donald and all that stuff. Like I really loved Pecos Bill and Johnny Appleseed and Paul Bunyan and, uh, and then the random ones of like, you know, the little house that was in the countryside, but then, and you, you see that like the people get married and move into it and have kids and it gets beat up and then all of a sudden the city gets built up around it. And then at the end it ends up being like getting redone and it's friends with all the skyscrapers around it, you know, like. Or, or the race car, or, or um, the old mill. Oh, the old mill, or the Suspense old mill. Hall. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the and the and the, the birds that were like getting battered yeah. by the wind and protecting their love. You know, amazing. Yeah, uh, Al, uh, what Johnny Fedora and Alice Blue Bonnet, like stuff like that. Like I, as a kid, you know, I, you don't. As far as I knew, it was brand new. I didn't know they made that in the '40s or the '50s or the '60s or whatever. I was like, this is great, and there's great music, and maybe that's why I love Sinatra so much. I don't know, but. I love that whole era and that really, yeah, meant a lot to me. And he's 55 years old. And I'm 55 years old. <laughs> and look fantastic. <laughs> what, 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 I, just, I was wondering, as far as Rise of the Guardians is concerned, what attracted you both to the project? Because the idea, I think, is far overdue to be able to take all of these iconic characters that we all grow up with, speaking of growing up with animation, you know, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all that, it, where did the idea generate from, and, uh, and what made you guys both jump at that being like, I want to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's originally, most of you guys might know this, it's from the, uh, the book series that Bill Joyce is working on, and 
Bill's a great uh, children's book illustrator and writer who's, you know, he, uh, Robots has been made into a movie. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Robinson, Meet the Robinsons yeah. has been made into a movie. A ton of things. Roly Poly and Roly Oly. Uh, yeah, Roly Poly Oly. All these things. And Bill had this idea. Uh, his daughter asked him a question one day, which was basically, Dad, do the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus know each other? And Bill just kind of went, oh, I don't know, but I bet they do. And from there, he kind of went on this whole quest to, to invent these new mythologies to, to answer those questions for his daughter. And I think that's the, that's the seed of what I found so exciting about the idea when I first heard about it. Because when I first heard about it, it, it sounded like, yeah, 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 way to cash in on all these guys and put them on Frito's bags and do all this other stuff and da, la, 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 la another kind of rape my childhood thing but <laughs> when one I, more one more when i thought about it for a few minutes more i started realizing when you're a kid you know particularly you actually believe these characters are real you don't just think of them as characters you think of them as they're beings that you have an emotional relationship with already they are real to you and when i started thinking about it that way and then what they all represent uh, the different attributes that they have they started becoming more like more like what Greek gods were to people in the ancient world. And it took on a whole, whole much more powerful and much bigger significance for me. And that's what really kind of got me truly excited about it. When I, when I came to DreamWorks after coming back from New Zealand and I went to take the tour of what properties they had and which ones I would be interested in helping creati creatively or come on board as exec executive producer, the first one I latched on was Guardians. I saw some of the art that uh, they had prepared, and I immediately knew we had something really special there. And it was early on in the process that I was able to, to uh, jam with them and come up with a thematic backbone for the movie and uh, introduce new ideas, a couple of designs where we were able to tweak. But the main thing is the world that they were creating. I mean, Peter had already galvanized some of the best uh, artists in DreamWorks and created a world that was instantly attracted to. Uh, Santa Claus with the, the tools that say naughty or nice immediately captured my imagination. And, and I, I, if, if, I believe uh, wholeheartedly, and it's in my movies, that you, that you have to believe to see. You know, that, that if, you, if, if you have faith, if you know inside you, you don't have to get reality to to tell you it exists. So that was what we started trying to infuse the movie with, and, but it was instantly a world. Like, as a, as a, as a film uh, director, do you like to create worlds, and they need to be finely imagined. Like, you know the details, and, and, and when I came and saw the art room for Guardians, I instantly knew this guy knew that world. That was not just separate characters, and separate worlds that he made them live in the same uh, in the same realm. Yeah. Ah, yes, um, you there. Kind of going off of what you were just saying, can you kind of talk about your research process in doing this? Like when you see a script, what you go through, the research, do you just have a moment where you're like, oh, that's it, that's what I'm doing, or? Peter, did you, did you research all these characters extensively? Um, yeah, we did. I mean, we looked back into the historical backgrounds of, uh, of, of, all, of all the icons and drew on what we could, but the other, the other big source for us was, uh, was uh, what Bill Joyce had done in terms of coming up with new aspects of the mythology, because one of the things we realized early on was for most of these characters, there's not that much in the way of like an actual mythology. I mean, when you think about it, most of the stuff we know about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or or uh, the Tooth Fairy has been filtered down through people's movies or cartoons or you know, Coca-Cola ads or whatever it is. So there's really not that much that's really been structured as you know, like a real story with a real thematic thread or a real, you know. And when you think about what these guys are, they're such powerful archetypes that it's really surprising that hasn't happened. So a lot of the stuff that we did in terms of research was really more, uh, trying to get to the core of what each of them really represented and then structuring their characters and what they, their function and functions in the story around that. I, I myself never get screenplays. 
You know, I, the only time I got a screenplay was on Blade 2. The rest of the time I write them or co-write them or develop them myself. So what I do is I, I, I have created a library for my own that it's a house separate from my family's home. And it's a library. It's crazy. I call it the man cave, but it's, it's, not, it's not beer and billiard <laughs> pool, pool tables. And it's really, it's, it's a house that has uh, about nine or ten libraries, each one organized by me. They are visual reference, background reference, mythology, religion, occult, and they are, it's, that's where I spend all my money. Like, I don't spend it in clothes, as you can see. <laughs> and I drive a, a shitty car. So, <laughs> you know, I spend it all on, on toys, uh, original art, and books. And what yeah. I do, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my, my manager will be calling you shortly. But, but uh, it's because I think that uh, surrounding yourself with images, surrounding yourself with the things you love, that's your inspiration. So what I do, what, before I start writing a screenplay, I, go, I have two cards, two library cards with wheels that are like professional library cards. And I go through all the libraries, and I say, oh, this one, oh, this one. And I pick all those books, put them in the card, go to a very comfortable sofa that I have, and I just browse. I'll browse through the artists. I try not to reference the things that are apropos the thing I'm doing. Like if I'm, I try not to research dry. Like I, I try to get inspired by great painters, by great writers, and I just spend the first few days or weeks, if I can afford it, just reading, reading and, and browsing, but not on the internet, browsing physically with the books, making notes, and then I go into serious research. For example, when we were writing The Strain, uh, the three novels, uh, Chuck researched one thing, I researched another one. I had to map out the sewer system in New York, the abandoned subway stations. I had to research layouts for this, layouts for that. When we were writing the third book, I needed to know how, how Imperial Rome was laid out when Caligula was, was uh, in the throne, and I needed to know who was the second in command, what they were building, all these things. And then at the end of that sort of mental trip, you start writing, you know, and, and, and it stimulates you. And then uh, what I do is I keep notebooks that I started keeping in 1990-something, and I browse through my notebooks. Because whenever I read something interesting, I write it down. So I can I reread them, and I reread what I was thinking when I was 21 or 22 or 23. And that guy has better ideas than I have at 45, 47. <laughs> and, and it's a dialogue with myself in that manner. And then it's research, but it's also a, a, a dialogue. And it makes you get insanely excited about things. I, I have four professional library cards. <laughs> I browsed through all of my stuff when I was three. Uh, and that kid was dumb. Uh, that, I'm kidding. That's. It. That blows my mind. That's, that's amazing that you have all that research material because oh, yeah. I spent all my money on, all the, wrong, on the wrong things and, and not on all that stuff. Are we, are we getting the wrap-up? We still got some time? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Who's next? Right there, yes. Nice shirt, sir. Excellent. Oh, is that Mike working? Shout, no? shout. All right. Oh, get the camera on me. All right. <laughs> Dad, hi, Jessica. Um, Dad, thanks for the Christmas money. Uh, my question is, since um, Prometheus release, you've been interviewed and said that Mountains of Madness is kind of harder. And we know really Scott might not go back with the sequel. If he pitched you the sequel, would you do it? Because it is your style. <laughs> that's that's, like, that's uh, unlikely to happen. Oh. <laughs> but, but I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, look, Mountains may happen one day. I mean, I don't know. I, I hope it does. I hope it does. I, I pursue it. We spent... Uh, such a long time designing stuff. We, we saw the ILM tests that were done for mountains. They were mind blowing as a, as a geek. I'm just like, oh, I want to see that movie. You know, and, but I, I don't know, you know, I, people, people think a career is something you plan, but it's more like, like a, an accident in slow motion. You know, and you see it clearly when you break your neck and then you, you bounce back and you go, oh, may, maybe you're right. And then you crack your spine. <laughs> And then you go, oh, now my teeth are going to the wheel. It's like, that's your life. In a very, very, very slow motion. And the accident happens in public, 
and the healing happens in, in private. <laughs> so that's essentially a film career. <laughs> you know? uh, so it's not like I go, okay, I'm, it's not like Scrooge McDuck. I go into my vault and dive into my hundreds of millions and go, what will I do next? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like that. I, I, I wish it was. Because <laughs> by now the, the, the goddamn thing would be empty. I would have spent and produced and directed many crazy things. But within those parameters, and, and if reality supports it, I would love to make the movie, you know? Who's got a working mic? Right here, right in front. Mr. Del Toro, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to be a director myself. I'm going to be applying to film school Me after too, Comic Con. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, there's a rumor that I heard that you were going to be directing uh, Gears of War. Is that true? No, no, no. It's, I, I've never spoke to anyone about that, no. I can make that happen. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no the, the, the thing that happens is a, a rumor starts and then I see it on the internet. I go, no, 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 it's not true. You know, like, oh, he's going to do Doctor Strange. I go, no, I'm not. You know, but, but no, no, no. It, this is not even, have been spoken of. I played them. <laughs> I finished them. I'm pretty good at them. <laughs> uh, I, I'm super active on the, on the video games. I'm a killer, man. <laughs> Pass the popcorn. Thank you very much. I have the physique of a video game god. <laughs> that, that is the most perfect soundbite of the entire weekend, I think. Uh, actually, Peter, do you play? Do you play video games at all? You a gamer at all? Uh, I do. You know, I kind of got to. Uh, I, I came late to them, and Halo is kind of just about my speed. Nice, nice. Because you can just kind of drop in. You don't have to find coins. You don't have to talk to the weird old man. You don't have to get the key <laughs> or the this or the that. You just drop in and start capping fool. So nice. that's that's kind of nice. my my speed. Nice. Who's got the next mic? Who's got the uh, right over here? Right over here. Um, well, working on Rise of the Guardians, was there a character that you took a particular liking to or that became your favorite to work with? Oh, was it, uh, did you have a, a, a particular favorite character on Rise of the Guardians that you took a liking to? Uh, you know, I'm like a dad. I love all of them. I love all of them. Yeah, I pretty much love all of them equally because they've all got... They all really have facets to them. I mean, the... Jack Frost, his story, though, is like the backbone of the movie, and we've been working so hard to give him some subtlety and some dimension and some, uh, some, some real emotion. Some pathos, and those, you know? those two guys back there in the black T-shirts are two of the lead animators, and they're geniuses. Dave, they are. Dave Pate, David Pate and Jalil Sadul, they're geniuses. I, I can't wait for you guys to see their work because it's awesome, but, you know, it's Jack's story. He's the heart of it, and I, he's, it's... He, that's, he's definitely the one that's closest to my heart. But I have a huge spot, heart, soft spot for uh, North, who's kind of this guy. <laughs> Santa Claus is kind of this guy. But and, I have uh, no fucking gift. <laughs> <laughs> I bring you a fucking cold. <laughs> no, no, I love North also. And there's a moment where North says, my belly tells me that may have come from autobiography. And I, I love him. I love Bunny. Bunny is a badass. So, you know, I, I, I love the way he looks. I love the way he behaves. He has the voice of Hugh Jackman, which is something I've aspired to all my life. <laughs> the accent I haven't perfected, but I, I'm on my way. No, I, I, I love all of them. Sandy is fantastic. You know, I, it, it, it's gorgeous. Yeah, they're all kind of them. all your babies. I mean, you spend so much yeah. time with them. We got time for one, maybe two more questions. One, maybe two. Who's got the next mic? Right back there. The man in the VPRD shirt, man. I know. All but right. After. Well, then you're next. All right. You'll be the last. Do not Don't ignore screw it up. Respect, <laughs> respect the sign, man. <laughs> yes. Hi, Guillermo. Um, Pan's Labyrinth is one of my absolutely favorite films. And there were so many terrifying images in that. And I just wanted to know where some of these creatures come from and where, that, where the, the ideas begin with something as terrifying as that, the creature that she runs from with, his, with the eyes oh, the and his hands. Man. It was amazing. And they're just, it's almost they're so terrifying, they're beautiful. And I just wanted to know from an artistic perspective where they come from. You know, ideas are never linear. I don't find them linear. Like, uh, I, I, love, I love to almost chase the idea. I, I don't, 
is, is like it comes in one way and the, the Pale Man originally was a, a huge wooden puppet with no mouth. Then we saw we, we cannot afford that. <laughs> it's too difficult, it needs to be CG partially, blah, blah, blah. And so we, we started thinking and I thought, I was on a diet <laughs> and I was, I was losing weight and I said, well, let's make a guy that lost so much weight and is so perverse about what he eats that he has a table full of food, but he will only eat innocence. You know, I thought that's really creepy. And so we, we started, and I had have, I have a friend that was uh, about 85 years old and was every day in the gym. And we had the horrible privilege of seeing him without a shirt <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. And, and Mike Mignola saw him after the sauna. And Mignola said, oh, there was skin going everywhere. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that image stayed with me. And I thought, well, maybe the pale man can be a, this really thin guy, old guy that has all this weight loss hanging. And we sculpted him. And, and, and then I, I saw the sculpture. And it has a perfectly, it had a perfectly, the face of an old man. Uh, DDT sculpted it. And, and I said, what if we take off the face? You know, what if it take entirely the face? And, and they had done a beautiful sculpture, and I called them and I said, take off the face, and they were like, fuck you, what do you mean? <laughs> we sculpted this amazing face. I go, yeah, but it's creepier if it's flat, and just has the little nostrils like the eyes. And, 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 and I said, and I'll give him the eyes somewhere else. And I, I was having dinner with my wife, and I said, well, maybe he can have no hands, and I can put his hand, hands made of wood, in a plate in front of it. And when it gets up, he puts them on, and she says, that's too much like Cronin on Hellboy. And I go, you're right. So I said, well, what if I give him stigmata, and I give him eyes on a plate, and he puts them in? And she goes, that sounds nice. <laughs> By the way, oh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but Dougie Jones, uh, who played the Pale Man, and also Abe Sapien, who you worked with many times, and, and, and the Fawn, is a buddy of mine, and I tried to get him here. I was going to surprise you. I wasn't even going to tell you, and I, he couldn't make it. But he, he sends his love to everybody. He really wanted everybody. to be here. Yeah. But, but then, then what happened is I was thinking about it, and I thought about him doing that for whatever reason. In every movie I do, somebody does that. But, but, and then I, I came to the set, and the night before I sketched this, and nobody knew about it. Nobody in the set knew about it. And I told Doug, you're going to do this. And it's one of those few times in the set when he did that, the whole set gasped. The whole set went, oh. And I went, oh, that, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> we might be onto something. And, and as you see, and then as we were processing it, we made it sit in its table. We made the murals about him eating children in the past. I thought about a whole story for him. And you know, what I do is like, I never get bored anywhere. You can have me waiting for my wife to wait to finish the manicure in, in, a, in a beauty shop, and I'm super entertained because I'm thinking about crazy stuff. Usually somebody comes in and massacres everyone, but I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> if you see me in a restaurant, my mind is fucked up. <laughs> and I'm smiling, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. It, 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 uh, but I can entertain myself for hours because I was uh, like that as a child. I was a very strange, thin, almost albino, blonde child, and you know that had spent his hours in the corner thinking the weirdest crap around. So I still do it, except I'm much larger. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so sorry, but sir, you get the last question, and we got and we got to do a quick question and a quick answer because I know we got to get you guys out of here. Well, I hope it's good. Well, I, I was just curious, Guillermo, um, about uh, if you could give us an update on Pinocchio, and. I know, it, speaking with animation and all that other stuff, and I know that your plate's really full, and you've now come back on that project, so. Yeah, Pinocchio is something I, I, I really want to do, and, and uh, we, we have almost all the financing together. We need a little bit of more financing, which we're seeking, but. Like five bucks. Yeah, I, I, listen, <laughs> I make fucking kickstart that shit, because. Okay. You know, Thank you. It, it, it's, it's, um, what happens is, every meeting I have, the same questions come in, does it have to be PG-13? I go, yeah. Why? I say, because it's pre-fascist Italy, 
and everybody behaves like a puppet except the puppet. And they burn books in, in, in uh, they burn books and destroy glass, uh, glass uh, fronts, and they, you know, in Pleasure Island, essentially they are marching, and it's really very politically incorrect and brutal, and, and uh, Pleasure Island scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. And I want to scare the shit out of people with that sequence again, <laughs> when they turn into donkeys. And, and, and there's uh, the idea of Pinocchio, I, I cannot ruin what I do with it, but, but we do some stuff that is not the norm. But I want it to be very beautiful and emotional. And it's very hard for people to understand in this business that something can be horrible and beautiful at the same time. It can be horrific and moving. When they go, oh, it's horrific. And, and, and especially when it's something that younger viewers may consume. Like, I'm, I'm, for, for me, a masterpiece right now is Adventure Time. And I think that's a fucking masterpiece. You know, I, I, I think uh, my daughters introduced me to it. I'm always very aware of what they like. And, and I just think uh, there's a lot of people in the industry that overprotect the minds of kids. And they are really doing a huge damage to the kids by shielding them from the truth. I mean, the beautiful thing about Adventure Time is it deals with loss, it deals with pain, it deals with horror, consumption, greed, lack of love in a wonderful way, but it doesn't shy away from anything shocking. Yeah. And that's the kind, I mean, when I think of movies for kids, I like to take risks. We, we, we take some risks in Guardians, but I would like to take much more risks because ultimately when I was a kid, Disney movies were fascinating, but they also scared the crap out of me. And I think Disney understood there is an anecdote, can be apocryphal or not, that when Disney tested Snow White, quote unquote, they was not testing, he showed it. Uh, the younger audience was crying, and, they, and, and the people in financing went to him very worried and said, those kids were crying. He says, great, don't change a frame. <laughs> you know, because I think it's essential to the fairy tales to have a dark element. And when we shield kids from the dark in the world, the dark in the world will hit them 10 times harder. Yeah. And then you go, so you've been lying to me yeah. all, this, all this time about life being candy colored, so screw you. You know, it's, I, I think as a parent, try, try to tell them and not shield them. You know, I think it's irresponsible. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Guillermo and Peter, yeah. please. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I don't know if we have any time. Huh? Do it. Do we have any time? We actually brought some stuff to show. Do we have yeah. any you time? You brought some stuff to show? Yeah. Do we have oh, any he time? brought some shit to show. Do we have any time? Do we have it loaded up? We have... Yeah, can yeah. we do it? Let's do it. Do they have it now? Do you guys have it in the booth? I'm seeing heads doing this. No. Have we handed knows. it to anybody? Uh, can I, I act it, it out? But, uh... <laughs> More importantly, can I, I get off this chair? <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's see. <laughs> Wait a minute. Listen, There's I may fall there, happening. man. Let's just see. Something's going I, on. You have no idea. By the way, what, 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 what's that? Uh, I, yeah. We may. Oh, yeah. Is anybody coming to the Nathan Fillion panel later on? Yeah? We, we, uh, Can Nathan, I go? I would love for you to go. Are you a fan? Oh, my gosh. I'm sure he'd love for you go. to be here. Yeah. We have a whole bunch of people that we got to get all you out and get all them in. So that could be a time thing. But I'm hearing. <laughs> Are we seeing it? Maybe it's not a problem at all. Two seconds. Two seconds. Well, you know what? While we're waiting, I, I, I love what you were saying before about the darkness in, 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 uh, in family films, you know, because I, I totally agree. I think that, and I think anybody here, have you seen any, uh, you know, classic animation or family movies from the past? Like, you know, those villains were wicked scary. Like, you, you really were freaked out. I mean, um, I mean, even Fantasia, I mean, literally parts of it had to be taken out of the movie because it got so dark. Yeah. And I do think it's a disservice to kids nowadays that everything gets so sugar-coated and every, it's like, no, protect them, protect them, protect them. It's like the world is a gnarly, unfair place. So if you keep doing that, then there's a good chance that when they finally do get out on their own, they're going to get slapped just back and forth. Yes. What's, we, and, we, and then we can do, when we show it? Okay, so I guess we just got ourselves a couple more questions. How's that? More posters, more posters. Right. Uh, who, who's got a mic and who's got a question? Right there, right there in the hat. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Mr. Del Toro. Uh, do you think it's a trend in the entertainment industry to kind of veer away from the R rating, and how does that limit your creativity as an artist? 
I just think uh, the, the thing is that you have, um, you have um, two types of people in the entertainment industry. You have the money guys that are reactive and driven by fear. And you have the storytellers that are driven by passion and madness. So there's a clash between the two. You know, as a storyteller, you should not be concerned and you should fight for the rating the movie needs to have not for the rating that will make more money. And it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very hard clash. So, I mean, when people say, oh, it's R-rated, therefore it won't make any money, then a movie that is R-rated makes money, and they go, oh, that's the, an, an exception. You know, but if it doesn't make money, it's a rule. So it's very hard to dispel these truths. I think that, I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle and we create the audience that demands things. That, and if you, if you start spiraling to the bad, the audience also starts spiraling to the bad. And it creates, oh, we make this because that's what they like. They being a phantom audience that buys tickets. But then if you start, when you, when you have something as gorgeous and successful as Inception, they go, oh, but that's one. You go, no. If you create more Inceptions, if you create more adult, sophisticated movies, people will go if they are entertaining and well done and, and thought provoking. But it's a, it's a very hard battle. Uh, sometimes I have conversations that are surreal with the money people, that you literally, you slap your forehead so hard, it stays there. Like it's really, I cannot tell you uh, stuff, some of the stuff that goes behind those doors is very weird. And they are driven by the purest fear in the world. And one of the things we, we embraced in Guardians is the idea of acknowledging fear but not living by it, you know, which is something that is, again, in, in the movies I made and, and something Peter had brought to the table from the get-go. But I think that's the thing. In our lives, we, we can be driven by fear or we can use it as a, as a constructive thing. I think... Fear is good if you know how to handle it, you know? I, I fear donuts. I fear pancakes. <laughs> That's two of us. I'm terrified of pancakes. Pancakeophobia. Like. <laughs> Pancakeophobia. Uh, who's got the next mic right there? Yes, um, you, ma'am. Who's your favorite character on Adventure Time? <laughs> favorite character in Adventure yeah. Time? You know, I, I like, I, I love Finn. I mean, and Jake, I, I, I love them. I have a, a big fin in my desk, the one that changes faces, you know, but uh, I, I, I think um, I, I, I like I liked their, their, the, the monsters that are, that the monster of the week, so to speak, like whenever they go and they confront the, the leech, I love, obviously, because Ron Perlman was doing The Boys, so I was a super fan, you know, but... Uh, I love that they are not afraid to go to disturbing places, you know? And uh, the Ice King is a masterpiece of pathos. And, and look, Kenny is a genius. You know, just, so Tom Kenny is a genius. I, whether it's a SpongeBob or any voice he makes, I, I'm a huge fan. And I love the fact that he is despicable, but he wants love, you know? And, and he's completely sick and twisted, but he's capable of... Uh, of uh, actors of pure love, acts of pure love. So those are, those are the things I love. I, the, the nice characters I like a little less. Now, and, and Lumpy Space Princess is a favorite uh, all through the house. And my daughter, my younger daughter, does her impersonation of Lumpy Space Princess often. And, 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 and uh, I told her the creator is the one that voices Lumpy Space Princess. And, I mean, we, we watch stuff together all the time. We watch uh, another one we like is, it's not very well known, is uh, The Amazing World of Gumball, which I think it, 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 it is not on anymore. We, at the house, we watch weird stuff, you know? We, we get together, clump together and watch You Dr. guys, Dr. your Boo. family watches weird stuff? Yeah. That is shocking. They're, they're on cosplay on the floor right now. <laughs> oh, no way. My little daughter what is, are they a, dressed is, is a castle crasher. Is a castle the, crasher? Is a castle crasher. Nice. My my older daughter is Captain America. Nice. <laughs> and Her and five thousand other people. And my wife is a steampunk goddess. Nice. So there we are. And I'm this guy does the 
um, Michael Moore without the, <laughs> without the cap. Miguel, Miguel Moore, Miguel, Miguel, Miguel Mora. Mora. <laughs> have you, have you, Peter, have you ever gone, have you done Comic Con before? I have. I, you know, I was actually here. I'm a comic fan from way back. Uh, I was actually here probably the first time, like back in the 80s, when it was like, this was probably it, you know, yeah. the size of this room practically. Yeah. But uh, yeah, over the, I've, I think I've been like twice since then in the past five years. I just can't believe how much it's like, man, it's like crazy how exponentially it's grown. And I, I, remember, uh, I remember being into comics, you know, before the movies kind of latched on to them and when it just wasn't that, you know, cool to be a nerd and uh, I, I, can, I can barely recognize the world now the way it is. Everything's it's like incredible. It's totally upside down. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Do we uh, have the shit? We don't. I'm I'm, I'm hearing I'm hearing Hoppa. I'm hearing that we cannot it's not it's not gonna work. Well technical difficulties. Oh no. Hey, I'm so sorry. So is there is there a website that they can go to? Is well you cannot it, one one thing was was uh, it's the second trailer, which has just come out. It's on uh, Apple, iTunes. I don't know how many of you guys have seen it, but it just hit, uh, I don't know, last week. And the other thing I wanted to show you was the first scene of the movie. But Now you'll just have to buy tickets and see it. Wah, 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 wah. Well, all right. Well, that's, Sorry, that, guys. I, I think that is our time then. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Thank you. Everyone, Peter. Thank you. One more time, guys. So one more time. Clap them on the stage. Thank you guys so much for your patience. Did you guys enjoy your experience here today? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Tell all your friends. That oh, oh, yes. And you guys, if you, if you don't mind, we're going to have you exit on the 6th Street side. In one, out, in one side and out the other. This is like the intestinal track of Nerd HQ, apparently. Coming, coming. Uh, someone comes up and makes a bad art.